welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. I'm so excited because I found a book that I had not heard of by Dr. Joseph Murphy. And as I read through it, I found that it was profound and wonderful. It was written before The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. It has some amazing chapters in it. I think that you will find this profound if you love Joseph Murphy as I do. The Wheels of Truth by Dr. Joseph Murphy. Forward. As the many facets of a diamond form an integral part of its sparkling whole, so the many chapters of a book take form and finally emerge in their effulgence of truth and wisdom. In Wheels of Truth, Joseph Murphy gives expression in a clear and lucid style to the fundamental principles of universal truth that God is the first cause and that to him, the conception of time and space does not apply. Furthermore, that the universe is but an emanation of God and the law, the intelligent purpose at the heart of things. It is not the skill in presentation alone which makes this book an ever recurrent inspiration. Its contemplative content touches the heartstrings and plays upon them the melody of eternal hope, bringing ever nearer the ultimate path, leading to peace and joy of faith and accomplishment. This is the everlasting heritage. Wheels of Truth is indeed a sanctuary to which all may turn for guidance, for it is sanctuary built out of the treasure of the light of divine illumination. It opens wide the door to understanding. It embodies the law of life. And Musman. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Chapter 1 The Sphinx. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion. On the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Ezekiel 1.10 In order to manifest, there was an emanation from the Absolute into two streams of consciousness called Father and Mother. The Mother is often referred to as the great sea of substance or light in which the Father reflected himself. The word mare or sea is sometimes called the Virgin Mary. The first step, therefore, in manifestation was the one being, becoming both masculine and feminine. Man has a conscious male and subconscious female mind, simply two phases of the one universal consciousness, specialized or individualized. It would seem confusing to refer to God as mind, except we clarify what we mean by mind. The subjective mind of man is the God in man. The conscious mind reasons, analyzes, and investigates. In other words, our conscious mind is constantly changing, and God changes not. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Consequently, that which changes cannot truly be termed God. To presuppose investigation of something is to deny the one being of omniscience and boundless intelligence. It is true, of course, that all is God. Nevertheless, we find it necessary for purposes of clarification to distinguish between the two phases of consciousness. Meditation or ideation is therefore no part of the functions of the subjective mind of man. All things in the world were made by the self-contemplation of spirit, as there is only spirit. Spirit may be termed the highest degree of matter, and matter the lowest degree of spirit. To put it in a more simple way, all things in the world, such as the elements, sun, stars, seas, trees, ad infinitum, are simply different degrees of condensation of the light limitless. I am the light of the world. There is nothing but light, sometimes referred to by scientists as a sea of scintillating energy, forever turning and twisting on itself. We look into space, and it seems empty but this radiant light or energy is forever turning, twirling, and rotating on itself. The ancients 
referred to God as a circle, having neither beginning nor end. He is without face, form, or figure, boundless, timeless, spaceless, infinite, soundless, sometimes referred to as the silent one motionless. He desires to express himself, which results in motion or activity. Therefore, the original velocity or seat of perpetual motion flows from consciousness or God and all other vibrations or motions in the universe are simply modifications of the one original motion. Let us look at this matter in a very simple way. God becomes man by conceiving himself to be man, the world not made but begotten. The world begotten means acquired by being, therefore, strictly speaking, nothing is made or created. It is simply God becoming all things. He is ideated in the incorporeal state. In the first chapter of Genesis, we read of the incorporeal man or God or Adam. All three mean the same thing as there is only man, nothing but man. Feeling himself to be all things, earth, herb, grass, trees, fish of the sea, fowl of the air, seas, stars, suns, and moons, and yet nothing, in particular, desired to express or particularize himself. The first chapter of Genesis sets forth the story of man who was in paradise, a desireless state. Thou hast been in Eden, and the ruby was thy covering, and desiring to express himself, he ideated a world of suns, moons, stars, seas, continents, and all things contained therein. Those simply were ideas or archetypes and were not objectified on the screen of space until after he became man or limited by his desires. Man is both conditioned and unconditioned. The unconditioned state is God or the absolute. The conditioned state is God defining himself as that man. Man is God limiting himself by conceiving himself as man. The timeless one is now conceiving in time the boundless one now conceives boundless and limitations. The spaceless one conceives in space. Man has forgotten the whole world is his, and he fights over one quarter of one acre. In the second chapter of Genesis, man appears first, and all things mentioned in the first chapter follow, as they were only thoughts of man in the first place. The earth is here for man to walk on, and exists because man dreamt it into being. What is man that thou art mindful of him? God's mind is full of man. There is nothing but man, and all things are the extensions of the one man. When man decides he no longer needs furs for his wife, all the fur-bearing animals will disappear. In the near future, all men will begin to eat synthetic meat. Consequently, all cattle, sheep, ad infinitum will gradually become extinct. The dinosaurs of old have disappeared. Their skeletons may be seen in the museums of the world. The reason for their disappearance is man no longer had any use for them. Moreover, he no longer had traits or characteristics resembling these ferocious animals. When the sly, cunning, deceptive states die out in man, the fox will disappear. This is true of all animals as they are simply extensions in space of the moods of man. In the ancient Greek myth, the Sphinx propounded to all corners the riddle of man, and those who would not answer the riddle died. The riddle was, what walks on four legs, on two legs, and on three legs? The ancient answer was supposed to be man because he crawls on hands and feet as a baby, walks erect on two feet until such time as he uses a cane or crutch to help him when he gets very old and feeble. This explanation is not the correct one. The inner meaning is as follows. Most of the human race is still walking on four legs, which means that we are worldly minded, catering to our passions and appetites and have forgotten the laws of life and the way of the spirit. The four-footed animal is the sensual man who lives to eat and enjoy the pleasures of the flesh. It also means the five-sense man who walks the earth believing what he sees and thinks his security rests in the accumulation of riches and the things of the world. He is the type of man who has forgotten to lay up treasures in heaven by feasting on the mood of peace and happiness within, thereby establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth. Only a few are walking erect who have discarded the animal nature, but of those who have matured, 
who have become of age, only a very small minority walk the earth bearing all their weight on the crutch of intuition, or the Christ within. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Sphinx is man's unconditioned consciousness, the unconditioned awareness within man. This is the center or Sphinx around which all revolves. It remains unmoved while the wheel of personality ceaselessly turns beneath him. The Sphinx is the synthesis of the four animals of Ezekiel, mentioned at the beginning of this chapter, which are both male and female. As was the Absolute before, he emanated himself into father and mother for the purpose of manifestation. Within you, the reader, the universe came into being. Within you, the universe is established. Within you, the universe passes away. Man is dual. He is both God and man. God is unmodified consciousness or formless awareness. This unmodified consciousness now becomes modified by becoming man. Man himself is the projection of the beliefs embodied in his own consciousness. In the same manner as the wave of the ocean is a projection of the contents of the ocean, and the wave goes back to the deep from whence it came. Likewise, ultimately man goes back to the great deep and becomes one with all. When man awakens from the dream, or illusion of separation, he will find it not robbery to do the works of God, though in the form of man he will find he is God, the only being there is, and that he had been dreaming a non-eternal dream. The vision spoken of in the first chapter of Ezekiel representing the four sacred animals and the wheel within wheels is explained as follows. The dot yod is the first circle. A point is dimensionless. This represents God or unconditioned consciousness in man, the spaceless, formless awareness. The next circle is the creative world. The third circle is the formative world, and the fourth circle is the physical world as we see it. The four animals also represent the four letters in the name Jehovah, J-H-V-H, the name by which all things are created. The first letter, Yod, represents the eagle or Scorpio. The eagle is a bird which soars above the storm and tempest where skies are blue and clear. Moreover, the eagle looks directly into the sun and is not blinded. The eagle represents a man's awareness of the fact that the seed of causation and omnipotence is within him. The next letter, He, is man's capacity to conceive his vision or ideal, symbolized by the lion. It represents man's desire. The third letter, Vow, represents a nail or the cementing of a fixed state. This letter is represented by the angel or Aquarius. The latter means meditation, or feasting on the reality of the state desired. It is actualizing the idea in consciousness. In other words, it is the feeling of being what you long to be, and the feeling of doing what you long to do. The final letter, He, symbolized by the bull, is manifest state, or the objectification of that which was subjectively felt within. To sum it up, the four animals mentioned are the perfect formula for prayer. The practice of this method will cause you to realize the most cherished desire of your heart. First, you realize that your own consciousness is God Almighty, the seat of omnipotence, thereby giving complete recognition to the power within. The second step is your new conception of yourself, your desire, or goal in life, or whatever you wish to be or do. The third step is the feeling which unites consciousness desiring with the thing desired. The fourth step is the physical manifestation of that which was felt in the unseen or withinness of yourself. We can take a lesson from nature, the seed, the soil, the creative essence, result in the tree or plant or fruit, as the case may be. Another example of the eternal trinity by which all things are created is hydrogen and oxygen plus the electric spark uniting the two, the resultant product, water. There are four stages to the enfoldment of all ideas. Suppose, for instance, that your main desire in life is to be a great musician who will bring happiness to thousands or millions. Ask yourself this simple question, can I now feel the naturalness of being the great musician? Enter into the mood of joy of actually being the musician now. 
You can do this by shutting out all evidence of the senses and silently contemplating the reality of the state desired. As you meditate in this manner, you will find that the time comes when this state is fixed in consciousness, and all the necessary qualities and attributes will be resurrected as they were always within you in the first place. Everything we see around us is in a process of change. A constant flux pervades nature. The formed is constantly returning to the formless. Therefore, that which changes cannot be real as God changes not. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We see the illusion and believe it to be the real, but in essence the latter is invisible. To see the real is to become one with it. We are here for no other purpose than to grow and in the growing discover and awaken to the true self. All our thoughts should be circles or bands of love. They knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love. In order to form this perfect circle, we must think in harmony with the one, the beautiful, and the good. This is sometimes referred to as being in tune with the infinite. We are not compelled to love, but we have freedom to love. Love is spontaneous and joyous, and we have the ability to give or withhold it. There is no compulsion to love. However, there would be no joy unless we knew the opposite. How could you experience joy unless you had known sorrow? If we are compelled to love, that would not be love, as love must be freely bestowed. Someone may feign love due to a necessity or sense of dependency, but this is not love. God expresses himself as life, love, beauty, order, symmetry, and proportion. When our thoughts are in tune with the infinite, they form a perfect circle or circuit and return to us, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. When our thoughts are negative, as when, for example, we indulge in criticism, cynicism, jealousy, or feeling sorry for ourselves or another, we are not in tune with the infinite. Consequently, there is no polarity. The circle of good is not formed. The dynamo has stopped. As truth students, we must realize that every lack, limitation, or adverse circumstance is the result of negative moods entertained by us, which portray weaknesses in us. And as you know, weakness is simply absence of power. It comes from nowhere. It is nothing. The remedy is to realize that the seed of omnipotence is within you, and by quietly stilling the mind, we realize gently that all power and energy necessary to overcome any situation, be it what it may, are ours now. This is the silent inner knowing of the mystic who is humble before God and proud before man. We come out of meditation as a live wire charged with sufficient power to melt away all discord, dissolve all hate, and dry all tears. Jesus goes from Galilee to Judea and from Judea to Galilee. This is simply the union of the conscious and subconscious mind in feeling. The idea held in the conscious mind, Jesus, can be dropped into Judea or subconscious mind by feeling the reality of it. The subconscious mind gives form to the impression made on in ways we know not. Thus is all manifestation. When our desire or ideal appears on the screen of space, this is the return of Jesus to Galilee. The latter means we are now consciously aware of the objectification of our desire. This journey on the map closely resembles a perfect circle, symbolizing simply the eternal wheel of the law. A battery is formed by connecting opposite poles of zinc and copper, causing a circuit which generates energy. This identical process is repeated when we meditate. Our thought must be charged with energy or emotionalized by love. In other words, we must become one with our ideal by feeling the reality of the state desired within ourselves. This is the polarization of thought or the wheel within wheels. So we begin to pray scientifically and discover our power by touching the reality within. We go from glory to glory until finally we die to all the beliefs and limitations of the world and go back to paradise. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, and the ruby was thy covering. We must learn to shut our ears to the confusion of the world which surrounds us. Let us open the inner hearing 
and aspire earnestly. He speaks to man, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. That urge which sends us in search of him is our search for the self within, our true self, or Christ. Forever we are bound to the one. We are wheels within the one wheel, the motionless wheel. What is a day, or a month, or a year, or a lifetime, or a thousand lifetimes? Time ceases for those who turn within to the wisdom, the power, and the glory. The quest will be forgotten when we have reached the goal. Deep within us is something that reminds us of our origin and urges us back to it. Our mission and purpose in this life is to cherish, enlarge, and glorify this memory, to follow sincerely the inner impulse until that spark grows by cultivation into a light and fills us and we identify ourselves with it. We can begin now to become one with the all by practicing daily the perfect relationship between the conscious and the subconscious. We are told that Eve, the subconscious of man, was taken from the rib while he slept. This is, of course, as everyone knows, an allegory. The meaning is obviously as follows. It is during sleep that the subconscious emerges. She comes forth from his rib. The symbology of the ribs is protective as the ribs protect the vital organs of the body. This merely portrays the protective nature of the subconscious. During sleep, Eve takes the office of instructor. The subconscious feeds the body it carries on the internal process of which the conscious mind is wholly unaware. It is said that Eve was made subject to him for good or evil. Our subconscious was perfect in the beginning, but we have defiled it. And in the same way that we have degraded and abused it, we can purify it by our thoughts and moods. Subservient was she to be to her husband all the days of her life. At night she talks back to man and takes charge and, according to his mood prior to falling asleep, either enjoys if his thoughts are of the good and the beautiful, or he has unpleasant experiences, particularly if he has gone to sleep in a turbulent mood. In this latter case, Eve is simply pointing out to him that he has mismanaged things. She also instructs and guides him and says what she pleases. Man must learn to have only the most exalted ideal and enthrone peace and happiness as his predominant mood. And by sustaining this state of consciousness, he will weed his garden, and then therein only lovely flowers will grow. Effectual prayer will change all the doubts, fears, and other negative states that may be lurking in the subconscious due to past errors and superstitions. Man must become the perfect lover and give all attention and devotion to his subconscious instead of to his conscious mind. He must not get confused and mix them, but must learn to tell them apart. If we will still the mind and enter into the feeling of love and peace, forgiving all men by casting any burden of resentment on the Christ within, we are then free. In this meditative mood of peace and joy, we can incline our ear to Eve, and she will speak with an inner assurance or by what is known as the still small voice of intuition. She will tell us where to go, what to do, and will truly be a lamp onto our feet. She may warn us in a dream by showing us the end. For example, if you have a fear of a disease, she may dramatize your mood by a dream showing you in a hospital attended by doctors and nurses. Now there is no such thing as an inexorable fate and the dream mentioned can easily be explained. The subconscious reasons deductively only and deduces a conclusion from the fear of disease entertained by the individual, and she dramatizes this fear in a dream. Now man can change the dream and completely neutralize the fear by a counter-suggestion of perfect health given to the subconscious. He can either enter into the mood that perfect health is his now and feel the joy of radiant health and peace, or in a meditative, relaxed mood, he can suggest with conviction one word, health, just prior to going to sleep and keep on repeating it until he falls asleep. This latter method has been used by many students of the author with excellent results in overcoming many chronic ailments. Unfathomed and unfathomable is the great deep of the interior being. In this no thing, the eternal will of God arises and then the no thing comes forth as something. 
This is the eternal wheel of the law. Chapter 2 Tuning In I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gayest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. John 17, 4-5 Before the world was I am, before Abraham was I am, when all things cease to be, I am. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. John 17, 21 Man has finished the work when he realizes that all men are within him. Man is like the line. It begins as a series of dots. The point has no dimensions. The point becomes a line. Our first dimension. The line bends. We now have two dimensions. The space or plane is not conscious of the line. The surface moves through a space in a dimension not contained within itself and becomes a cube. This is our third dimension. The cube is not conscious of sides. Each side sees another as separate from itself. When the side becomes one with the cube, it no longer sees other sides as the cube is only conscious of being a cube and not conscious of sides. God is not conscious of Catholics, Jews, Protestants, and Buddhists. He only hears and sees in secret. Therefore, we know him only when we touch him in the silence through feeling. We must become conscious of being one with God. Then we will not and cannot see another. We are garments of the one being moving through the illusion of time and space. All stars, planets, suns, all things are extensions in space of the spaceless being or formless awareness within man. Therefore, if the primal essence of man is God, he is everywhere in mind and there is no place he is not. The life is the illusion of time and space based on sense belief. When we meditate on the truth, we will do away with all worldly values, all possessions. All these things will cease to have value. We give value to temporal objects pertaining to time as opposed to eternity because they seem to remain solid or fixed, such as our bank account, our jewelry, our homes. We believe our home will be there when we return to it and we find our beliefs confirmed. In the future, when man develops the use of his mind, it is a scientific statement of fact that the great majority of mankind today does not use one-tenth of his mind capacity. He will be capable of collapsing time and space. Then, for example, a man living in New York can instantaneously be in San Francisco or any other part of the world. No means of conveyance will be necessary. Incredulous as this may seem, it has, through the ages, been accomplished by adepts did not Jesus walk on the waters and come through closed doors, translate his body at will, and appear to his disciples at will? He was not conditioned by time or space or the laws of gravitation. Man will change the atomic weights and structures of any substance. For example, he'll be able to instantaneously change the atomic weight of a piano and cause it to go through the eye of a needle and then cause it to assume its former shape. All things are possible to him that believeth. All things not some things, glorify thou me. Man comes from the Absolute, and he goes back to the Absolute when he remembers who he is and dies to all beliefs and superstitions of the world. When someone dies, he lives on in you, the reader. That state of consciousness is within you. God dreamed himself to be a man. Now we must awaken and go back to the glory which was ours before the world was. All the elements and minerals we speak of are modifications of light, simply congealed energy or extensions of man's thoughts. We say certain races and tribes are savage, yet these primitive people can send telepathic messages without radio or wires. They bring rain at will. They melt snow with energy from the body. We believe hot water is the way to melt snow in front of our door. We don't believe we like to believe, we want to believe, but we really don't believe. When we believe we can melt snow by heat from our body in the same manner, then we can make a telephone call. Then we will not feel it robbery to do the works of God. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You, the reader, are the heart and center of all mankind. You, 
are the center of your world, and it revolves like a wheel around you, but you are the exact center of the wheel. As you think and feel, so will your world be. The greatest commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. We must not divide the one and see elements, people, seas, and continents. We must not split the one. Remember, it was said, What manner of man is this whom the winds and seas obey? All the storms and strife of the world are within man's consciousness. We must refrain from lighting candles. People believe the power is in the candle or ceremony or ritual. They do not realize it is all a matter of belief. There is only one man in the world, therefore there is no other to hurt, only you. All treatment is to oneself also, all love to one. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Thy neighbor is yourself. If you get a call from a friend and he is in trouble, you are not aware of that trouble until he brings it to your attention. So you go within and hear good news for him. If your finger hurts, it is a warning, and you then give it your attention. There is one subjective being, one God, and he is the Father of all, and the kingdom of heaven is within you. Therefore, if you impress a conviction in your consciousness, then that conviction must become objectified in the other. The other must change because you have changed your concept. If we begin to change our concept of people and things, then our world will change. When we really convince ourselves, instead of talking about it, that we are contained in God and God and man are one, then we will feel it not robbery to do the works of God. We made himself equal with God and found it not robbery to do the works of God. We must convince ourselves by sustained belief that we are of God and that nothing is impossible to us on that level of consciousness and so condition ourselves that when we ask a thing we shall know it is finished. Then we become as Isaac, blind to the evidence of the senses. We bless by touching and feeling the reality of the ideal sought. Chapter 3. Relaxation. Be still and know that I am God. We must realize that the cause underlying most failures to effectual prayer is muddled thinking and lack of emotional control. The important thing to observe is that we find the same law operative in the magnetic attraction of impulses of fear, jealousy, anger, and despair, which are responsible for most of the failures and frustrations in life. As we find in the ineffable emotion of love which results in good, a single principle, an identical force lies underneath accomplishment or failure. Fear begets inescapable tribulation. It is the manifestation which alone differs according to the mood of the individual. All disease has its origin in emotional frustration. Man is the product of his emotions and moods. The tendency is to project blame on another for unfortunate circumstances, stressing heredity, environment, or lack of opportunity. This attitude of mind sometimes acts as a temporary hypodermic to bolster lagging morale, but it does not get rid of the causes of suffering and afflictions. The world is a mirror reflecting our predominant mental attitude and is constantly showing us ourselves. We do not always like what we see, Neither do we take the initiative and proceed to change the picture. If we indulge in negative tendencies, we soon come face to face with conditions of a similar vibration. Like attracts like. This is the perfect working of the immutable law of cause and effect. We consistently deny that everything depends on cause and with stupendous blindness seek to change the effect. A streak of jealousy aroused in us will indubitably attract situations involving other jealous people either in the home, at business, or in our social world. Quite often we hear people say that the one thing they dislike most is jealousy in others. If we watch their reactions, we find the fault is in them. What we think or feel finds its affinity in our external world and finds its likeness. The lesson to be learned is we must take the beam out of our own eye by self-study and self-examination. Eventually, we shall not discern even the mote in our brother's eye. When we see faults in others, let us look inside ourselves. 
for there we shall find, if we look with unbiased examination, them hidden in a corner of our own thoughts. Frustration and an inferiority complex are as a rule due to frustrated vanity. If we constantly fail in our efforts meet a stone wall, we must look within and see why it may have the appearance of important circumstances. To effect a change of circumstances, there must be a change of consciousness, a consciousness dominated by the spirit of success. In order to succeed, we must have the confidence of success, erasing from the mind every discordant thought. It is our mood, the intensity of sustained faith, which impresses itself on the subjective mind. The barrier to success is when we allow our personal ego to draw a boundary around our consciousness. It is good also to ask ourselves if we are simply seeking recognition and applause for ourselves, or are we sincerely interested in what we are attempting for its own sake? Do we want only to feather our own nest, or do we want to serve humanity? Do we want to be an Emerson, a Lincoln who loved humanity, or do we seek self-aggrandizement and personal glory? Shall we give a lasting message of truth, or shall we condition it to crowds of people? If we have something to offer, it will be used except we stand in its way. Vacillation, wavering, and the so-called mercurial ups and downs result from a lack of an inner objective or ideal. Often a person says, I am going around in circles. He hopes someone will come along eventually and show him the way. He lacks stability and does not know if he would only become still and listen to the inner voice. It would speak to him and guide him. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. In the scriptures, Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we are given both the formula and the mode for bringing to birth the living manifestation of our archetypal ideal. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Breathed into or inbreathed, if this breathing into can create one manifestation, it can by virtue of its power create another. Therefore, we shall prescribe a rhythmic breathing exercise to overcome nervous tension and induce relaxation. At first, until it becomes natural, it is well to perform the exercise sitting erect or lying down on a flat surface. There can be no accomplishment where there is tension. Effortless effort is the maxim for all spiritual progress, which is the prerequisite of all earthly achievement. Exercise. One, your chest, neck, and head should be held in a straight line as possible. Two, then inhale through the nostrils, mentally counting six pulse throbs. Three, hold breath during three counts. Four, exhale through the nostrils during six counts. Five, hold lungs empty during three counts. Six, repeat as often as desired as no slightest discomfort is felt. After a little practice, the rhythm will be perfectly established without necessity of mentally counting. When this is achieved, all tenseness and effort will disappear and complete relaxation results. Later, you can execute this exercise with perfect ease while walking each step a rhythmic unit of count. Whenever in the beginning, especially for city dwellers, where there is the continued interruption of traffic crossings and congestions, it is better to confine the exercise to the sitting or lying down posture. In addition to the physical reaction of this rhythmic breathing, there is a spiritual response. With each inhalation, you may impregnate your subconscious with whatever suggestion you wish. It is important to remember that suggestions should be practiced simultaneously with the in-breathing. This chapter is written primarily for beginners and for those students who have not learned the fine art of relaxation and repose, which is akin to sleep. The latter is really a device intended to induce the auto-hypnotic state which is most ideal for impressing the subconscious. For example, if you are gloomy or despondent as you in-breathe, orally or mentally say, I am happy, and feel it, smile. This exercise may be repeated 24 or 100 times at one time and repeated as often as you like. When we learn to breathe rhythmically, 
its effect on the nervous system is such that all tension is dissolved. All of us know that from a physiological standpoint, deep diaphragmatic breathing is very beneficial in promoting bodily well-being. The sensation of well-being, which always follows the drawing of a deep breath, favors the acceptance of any new suggestion. During these breathing exercises, we should visualize ourselves as we long to be, full of vigor and health. The regular rhythm of breathing brings about a stimulus analogous to that exerted by every rhythm, such as, for example, music or dance forms which have a soothing and lulling influence. This rhythm tends to immobilize the attention and induce relaxation. Many students find the suggestive value of respiratory exercise a great boon. Beside a case, an elderly lady who suffered from asthma for many years completely cured herself by the following exercise. She sat down quietly in her armchair and began to breathe slowly, and with each inhalation, she would silently affirm, I am all health. She would keep this up for about 10 to 15 minutes, morning and evening, and sometimes at noon. In two weeks' time, she was completely cured. Man is a pulsating, rhythmic being. Our bodies are as much subject to the rhythmic laws as is everything else in the universe. The ancients said every atom in space dances to the rhythm of the gods. The universe, one verse, is simply one note or tone in God, but there is an infinite number of tones or rates of vibration within the one. Everything that we see is vibrating, and nothing is in absolute rest in nature. Only God or the Sphinx is motionless. Nature is the birth or activity of God, the one manifesting himself in countless ways. The moment forms appear in the world, they begin to change, and from them appear other forms, and so on ad infinitum. Forms are simply appearances. They come and go, and likewise the body of man is constantly changing. There is almost a complete change in the chemistry of the body in a matter of minutes. So much so that scarcely one atom or electron composing your body will be present a few months hence. All is vibration. Constant change pervades the universe. The beating of your heart follows a certain rhythm. So also does the ebb and flow of the tide. In breathing, therefore, it is important to get into the mental mood of rhythm, such as the counting employed in music. For the individual who finds it difficult to relax and immobilize his attention, it is well to isolate himself in a room where there will be no disturbance. It is important that you get into a rhythm until you feel the vibration throughout your whole body. Now look at a blue light, preferably a reading lamp with a blue bulb, 30 or 40 watt placed about 10 inches from the eyes. Look directly at the bulb. This has an auto-hypnotic influence and induces profound relaxation. When the eyes are tired out, close them but do not go to sleep. Maintain conscious control of your thoughts. There must be no sense of strain as immobilization of the attention must be carried out with a minimum of voluntary effort. Form a clear mental outline of your ideal, of what you desire, and then feel the reality of it. There must be one pointedness of thought. Dwell on the fact that you now are the being you long to be, or that you have that which you long to have. Dwell on the thought with confident expectancy. After a week or ten days, discontinue use of the blue light, as it is only a physical adjuvant, and we must not become slaves to physical props of any kind. We must begin to induce the happy, relaxed state by the mental image we have. Failure is due to lack of faith. The law never fails. Chapter 4. Dreamer Awaken Religion means to turn back to the One, in other words, to a realization of the oneness of all things. There cannot be two religions for the same reason there cannot be two gods or two men. Man has made many creeds and through ignorance called it religion. There is only one man and the whole world is within him. The true self or life of that man is God the invisible, unmodified consciousness or formless awareness. Therefore, when man worships or prays, he really prays to the higher self within him. The church is within. The choir is within. 
the congregation is within the high priest is within all is within the church is his own consciousness the choir is the joyous feeling held in meditation the high priest is your i amness which declares i am that which i feel myself to be i am that i am the congregations are your ideas thoughts moods and concepts about people and things in other words the congregation is your belief about yourself and others the shrine of your god is truly ornamented when adorned with the righteousness of the believer your righteousness consists in seeing all men using the law righteously and growing perfectly there is no more precious jewel than that of a noble life and the highest altar of the lord is that of the purified heart of man it is our faith in the gilt-edged securities and stocks impermanent and oft times becoming valueless or in the christ within by the constant application of the golden rule we will become like jesus who by the transcending of his human wisdom became one with the sole urge of all mankind he was in truth the substance of the great universal desire the actual embodiment of the age-old quest for peace wisdom and illumination every day of our lives we must begin to meditate upon the beauty the glory and the profundity of the eternal one dwelling in the changeless one within ourselves we find an ever-abiding peace which stretches out beyond the stars beyond time and space when we are imbued with lofty ideals when we think universal thoughts little things disappear and all the petty things of life become inconsequential and forgotten our soul actually becomes filled with the glory of the whole and the limitations and restrictions of our daily life vanish we find that this happy mood lifts us up and brings us in rapport with the universal mind of god as greed jealousy discord and other narrowing concepts which bind us to the wheel of pain disappear from our consciousness forgotten in the joy of truth we then become a citizen of free consciousness we become one with the universal vistas constant meditation either in the woods in your own home or wherever you may be causes your soul to thrill as though touched by a divine harmony and a pulsating throbbing feeling pervades every part of you many experience it as a tingling sensation in the spiritual area as if the melody of the gods were played on the sacral plexus in this profound relaxed mood men oftentimes realize that this planet we call the earth becomes a dot in consciousness and all things which seemed so great and wonderful in the world become as insignificant as the fading planet itself the wings of the shekinah with its shining glory and attached to each one of the wheels of thought within us takes us onward and upward the cherubims are all around us we are suffered by the golden flame of the seven candlesticks before the throne we float in this formless awareness beyond the stars until finally the flickering lights of the stars suns and moons vanish in the eternity within ourselves we find that the immensity of being is our true self we have found the all there is neither time nor space now nor then neither he nor she only the ever flowing reality flowing on forever all things we once witnessed are now a forgotten dream the dreamer has awakened and for an infinitesimal moment are taken of a glimpse of reality you have found there is nothing but you the sphinx the unmoved mover of all the inscrutable face of the sphinx the ageless one which changes not is found to be your true identity the christ within the lord of lords the king of kings and the prince of peace the ancient of ancients blessed be he the ancient of days you now cease dreaming but you continue contemplating the moment which lasts forever you are the solid which reached its melting point and have melted into the boundless one his thoughts are your thoughts his heart is your heart his dream is your dream his contemplation is your contemplation then you know that you have finished the works which he gayest you to do 
Now you sing the song of the Lamb, saying, Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Before the world was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. When all things cease to be, I am. I am the only living reality, the timeless one within man. The lost word has been found. You have truly finished the work here when you have discovered who you are and returned to the glory of the Father. In the instant you become one with the all, you find you are the world, and motion, gravitation, time, and space are all within you. You know now that you are the Alpha and Omega, that which was, is, and ever shall be. All things in space now revolve and dance as countless wheels within you, the eternal wheel of the law. You are the creator of heaven and earth, whose dream is creation. You are also the dream, and when the dreamer awakens, the creation disintegrates. When all things cease to be, I am. All the world is but an infinite dream of the infinite one. When we come out of this meditative phase, we find we have fallen. Remember, man from whence thou hast fallen, and do the first works. Even though we have returned to time and space, we must forever keep our eyes upward. We find we are never the same again, and will always remain in the world, but not of it. We will become Jesus the Christ, or God-man. We then say, I in thee, and thou in me, and I am glorified in thee. To us all men are simply aspects of ourselves, parts and members of the one body, ourself. I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified in the truth. All men will become the all, and see the transcendent glory which was theirs before the world was. All imperfect parts will become perfect and one with reality and eternity. The resurrection comes as a sunrise and never sees night. It remains forever, for we are now one with our Father and thus perfect. We have truly returned to the glory of the Father, to go no more out in rags and sackcloth. Chapter 5 The Man of Tomorrow The motto of the man of tomorrow will be careful for nothing. This simply means that he will be indifferent to the failure of the law. It is a conditioning process. The law here referred to as the Lord God Jehovah. To put it simply, this means the law of God in manifestation or the wisdom of God in operation. The man who becomes indifferent to the law is one who has perfect control of his subconscious and directs it wisely so that whatever he feels can be done is automatically put into effect. To such a man there is no failure because he believes that all things are possible to God. He knows the divinity that shapes our ends is the God in smiling repose within himself, the subjective mind. The man of tomorrow will immediately embody his desires by so disciplining the mind to acceptance that all his wishes will be immediately fulfilled. He will not use effort to lift tables, pianos, or to wash dishes. He will simply sit in an armchair and in a partially subjective or passive state see all these things done. The man of tomorrow will not have to use a switch to turn on the light, as he knows all light is within him. I am the light of the world. His own I amness contains all suns, planets, stars, moons, Therefore, at his will, all light emanates from him. It will be impossible for him to be sunburnt, as he controls all rays which are really within him. Incidentally, no one is burnt by the sun. The burns come from within man due to his belief or fear of sunburn. Holm, a Scotsman in 1843, used to go through windows, lift tables at random without touching them, and increase or diminish his height at will. This man, in the presence of the greatest scientists of the day, overcame the law of gravity by projecting himself through a window and flying through space without any mechanical aid and then came in through another window. He also defied the most exacting scientific tests by proving to the scientists that he could cause scientific instruments 
which were wired and solidly fixed in a special cabinet to move freely about the room and be handled by many. There is no mystery about this. It simply means that in boyhood he was conditioned into believing that he was able to do this. The man of tomorrow will not use airplanes to travel on the contrary, he will use no mechanical means, but will simply collapse time and space by going within himself and feeling that he is now where he wants to be, and when he opens his eyes he will find himself there. If God is spaceless, where can we travel? Time and distance are but the illusions of the five senses. God is omnipresent. If so, he does not travel. God is timeless, therefore time is but an illusion. The man who prays scientifically and realizes his own consciousness to be God collapses time and space. Many men today believe they can collapse time and space only in an astral body. Consequently, they can do only this, according to your faith, be it done unto you. There is a case recently of a woman who asked a metaphysician to find out where her husband was. She had not heard from him in six months. This mystic went into meditation, visited him in London, and had dinner with him. The lady who was waiting in an outer room opened the door and saw this metaphysician in a trance. In a few minutes he came out and told her that her husband was returning by boat, giving the name of the boat and the date of arrival. When this lady's husband returned home, she told him about her experience with the man of prayer. He said, Yes, a man appeared to me and asked me why I had not written to you and several other questions. We ate together and at that time I did not think his questions strange, but when he disappeared as we went through the door of the hotel, I thought the experience rather unusual. We must condition ourselves to collapse time and space bodily and not astrally. Some men believe they can travel astrally and be seen and transact business, others that they can only transport themselves psychologically and not be seen, but can see what is going on elsewhere and come back and report it. It is all belief, nothing but a conditioned state of consciousness. There is no space. We are living in the illusion of time and space. There are men in America today and in other parts of the world who never use streetcars, trains, or other means of conveyance to go home. They simply realize in consciousness that they are where they wish to be. The man of tomorrow will not go from New York to London. He knows that London is within himself, so he brings there here. Thereness becomes hereness. He will close his eyes and simply feel that he is in London, that moment, doing the things he wants to do. He simply feels the naturalness of the state, and according to his faith, it is done unto him. Again, there is no mystery about this. We must begin to practice collapsing time and space now today. And finally, it will become a conviction and our demonstrations will be instantaneous. The ancient mystics knew all about the law of mathematics, geometry, aerodynamics, engineering, but they saw no need for an airplane or train. The law of gravity is simply a belief of man, that's all. Therefore, these men, knowing the great laws of life, as taught in the Bible, realize this simple fundamental truth, that all potentialities were within them. As God dwelt within them, men may scoff at these things, but that's nothing new. People scoffed at the idea of radio, television, airplane, telegraphy. All these things were believed to be impossible by the so-called wise men of the world that knew all, yet knew nothing. If we are truth students, we must surely realize that all things are possible to God. Therefore, what is strange or startling about a man being in New York one moment and Chicago the next? I mean bodily, in the real physical sense. Men who cannot read or write do this in the islands nearby this country. We must walk in the consciousness that is impossible for our prayers to fail. Dream all things into being. Fix them as actual states of consciousness and they will embody themselves. First, visualize. Second, actualize. Feel all things naturally. The whole is contained where you are now as God dwells within you. The doctor of tomorrow will not prescribe pills, x-rays, diets, or any other medical treatment. He will assume the attitude of prayer and practice the law of substitution. He will not see a sick person. On the contrary, he will see the perfect man, radiant and expressing himself joyously. The doctor of tomorrow will hear the good news, as he will be the true mystic tuning in with him who heals all diseases. There are some physicians who do this now. Homes, real estate, property, and money will have no value for the man of tomorrow. 
Those who've read the new metaphysical book called This Is It may recall the young man who could talk to his brother thousands of miles away without the aid of any mechanical device. There are many similar incidents related at the present time. The human ear is capable of apprehending a small band of sound waves. A dog can hear certain sounds that man is incapable of hearing. The voice of a husband overseas, for example, creates a sound wave. These waves go around the world and never stop. We can hear from any part of the world on the radio, yet the man on the radio speaks in a normal tone of voice. The reason we hear him is that we and the radio announcer are equipped with a sensitive apparatus for sending and receiving sound. A loving husband and wife are equipped with a greater instrument, the love of God, or love of oneness. The husband's thoughts and feelings are transmitted to his wife and her feelings go toward him. The waves of sound bridge the gap. Some wives in this country hear the voices of their husbands as plainly as if they were one foot away, yet their husbands are in the South Pacific or Europe. If the loved ones at home practice consciously and systematically the art of listening for the voice, they would converse freely and as easily as if they were together. In fact, more articulately, the man of tomorrow will not use radio, television, telegraph, or any instrument. All those will be obsolete. He will use only his mind. Telepathy has been proven more accurate, for example, than radio messages. Read Thoughts from Space, written by Sir Hubert Wilkins and Harold Sherman. We spoke of real estate losing its value. Yes, the businessman will leave his office in New York and instantaneously be in Venice, California, or Italy. He will not need that summer home, or that air-cooled automobile, or that yacht in the ocean. What can you give that man of tomorrow? He will have all things. You can't sell him sunshine. He commands the winds and the waves. If you want money for something, he will put up his hand in the air and give you some coins. All things are in the air. Mentally, he will mine the air and precipitate what you ask. Nothing is made. Nothing becomes. All is. And all is God. The man of tomorrow will not be a cynic, the so-called wise man. He will be the humble man who says, I believe, Lord, help thou mine unbelief. The man of tomorrow will also be able to project his vision to any part of the world and see the person to whom he wishes to talk. He will not have to resort to television for this. He that hath made the ear, can he not hear? He that hath made the eye, can he not see? When we turn within to our own consciousness which is God, we are at the seat of causation, seat of all power. Consequently, we don't have to pay any attention to what medical science or any science says about our limited capacity to see and hear. For the simple reason, he that sees all and hears all is within us. Believest thou this? Clairaudience and clairvoyance are well known today, and the true scientists acknowledge them to be true. Man's thoughts constitute a veritable universe. A man and a woman in love with each other will grow into a single harmony. If we love God by tuning in and claiming his attributes, we will grow into his likeness, and then will not feel it robbery to do the works of God. Man is God walking the earth, but man has forgotten it. We really tune in with our higher self when we tune in with God. The man who sings the song of the Lamb, I am Christ, is the man of tomorrow. The doors may be shut and the windows barred, but the man of tomorrow will appear in the midst of assemblage in the flesh. He will walk on the water and appear and reappear at will. These occurrences will be so common that people will no longer say, What manner of man is this whom the winds and the seas obey? The man of tomorrow will be spirit-like. The sun will not burn him. The weather may be 30 degrees below zero, and he will not feel the cold. Thunderbolts might split the skyscrapers. The rivers may rise and flood the valleys, and he will not be afraid. He will mount the clouds. He will ride the sun and moon and ramble at ease beyond the four seas. He knows no death and has no thought of gain or pain. Chapter 6 Children of Light All man-made laws have penalties attached to them. God made all things and pronounced them good. The law of God is truth. A law in the usual sense presupposes two parties and an agreement, but these are all man-made. If man throws a stone in the air and it falls to the earth, this is a law or truth. 
and contains no reward or punishment. If you permit the stone to fall upon you, it simply means that you failed to get out of the way. It is utterly false to say that God makes laws which man disobeys. Man believes a lie, and the disease and the misery that follow are based on his belief in the lie. We have made a law unto ourselves and now are bound by the chains of our own false beliefs. The laws of nature are not different or separated from the laws of man's inner life. None of the forces of the universe exist outside man. The innermost reality in man is the one identity within which the whole world moves, lives, and has its being. The center of this great wheel is always at rest. It is the Sphinx, or the formless awareness in man which remains unmoved throughout all the cycles of transformation. Ye shall delight in the Sabbath. The Sabbath is our conviction, the rest of the Lord, the stillness which follows the inner knowing that our prayer is answered. We must not hear anything but good. When you hear a person criticize another, you are actually hearing him tell you who he is. You do not have to check on his references. He has completely revealed his character to you, and character is destiny. All the things he criticized were within him. At a truth lecture, members of the audience frequently say, I'm exceedingly glad I brought my husband or wife, as the case may be, tonight. For what you said certainly applied to him or her. The listener never thinks that what is said applies to him or that he is in any way to blame. We believe if we lose an article that costs $5, we have lost something of value because we are constantly thinking in terms of dollars and cents. But when we lose a joyful state, which is the greatest loss we can sustain, we don't mind that because we seem to expect the sad, gloomy state and look upon it as inevitable. The writer is frequently asked to say grace at meals, particularly when invited to homes or sometimes by truth students. Go thy way and eat thy food with joy. The only real thanks is a joyful state. It is the great digester and assimilator. It is the silent inner knowing that there is abundance of God's bounty. Mechanical repetition of some fancy prayer is meaningless and distasteful and gives rise to indigestion in some instances. If you are in a joyful mood, the natural secretions will play their role to perfection and the food that you eat will be completely digested. If you believe that food is bad or if you are in a dejected, critical or angry mood, the food will become a lump in the esophagus and stomach. The gastric juices will dry up. This can be proven readily under hypnosis. If you are worried, it makes no difference what you eat. The result is usually ulcers of the stomach or duodenum. Become relaxed and happy and you are cured. The ulcers vanish, as they never really were. The ulcers existed because you continued to believe a lie and the opinions of man. Disease is what follows a belief. Some pray to entities in space for a cure. Others take pills. Others pray to a god outside themselves, wondering whether they are worthy. Praying is a hit or miss proposition to most people. They don't know whether prayer is answered or will be answered. It is true that if a person believes in a pill, a cure will follow. It is the belief that cures, not the pill. A belief is one thing, and truth is another. The children of this day are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Matthew 16, 8. And I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Luke 16, 9. This means that it is better for a man to believe in something rather than not have faith in anything. For the children of this day are those who have worldly beliefs such as the superstition that rabbit's foot will protect them from all harm while driving. If man believes this implicitly, so long as he has the rabbit's foot, he will be immune to harm. Of course, the stupidity and falsity of this belief are manifest to the truth student who knows that when the rabbit's foot is lost or stolen, the owner's God is lost and misfortune follows. However, such a man, though he may believe that if he lights a candle or several candles, someone will be healed, is wiser than the children of light, meaning a person who has heard and acknowledged truth but fails to apply it is no wiser than he was before. Unfortunately, there are thousands of these children of light who can pass on an examination in metaphysics and get 100% or at least 99% and at the same time can't demonstrate over a toothache. They never apply it, just talk about it and around it. 
Therefore, the man who believes in the power of talismans, amulets, candles, spiritual entities, walking in space with healing in their wings, is wiser and better off than these children of light. We must become men of light and let our light shine before men, that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who are in heaven. The food that we eat must be spiritual. The bread from heaven, which is the living truth, this gives us health and happiness. When we sit down to eat, let us believe that what we are eating is good for us. We are eating under protest, it will do us harm. We drink a cocktail to please our hostess, and we feel it is bad for us, it will work harm. It is not what we would like to believe, but what we really believe that matters. Some people like to tilt tables while they eat and produce sounds at will in different parts of the table. This procedure is due to a certain state of consciousness and not due to spirits. It is due to a law of dissociation. It is the peculiar passive state where you begin to write on the Ouija board while waiting for it in the attitude of expectancy. Man and no one else operates the Ouija board. There are no discarnate entities and persons practicing automatic writing. Ouija board readings and mediumistic operations are usually living in fear of evil entities in space. Consequently, this fear and negative state result in a split personality or so-called schizophrenia. The above is bad food, and the scripture points out, Thou shall not eat any abominable food. We must take our ideas, which are facts of consciousness, and secrete the emotions necessary to assimilate wonderful food. This is the happy, joyous mood, and if we go to sleep in that state, the desert will blossom as the rose. Chapter 7 The Voice in the Wilderness And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. John 1 20. I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. John 1 26 27. Jonah, or John, is not the Christ, but gives birth to the Christ. Every man, after calling the twelve disciples to discipleship, becomes Jesus the Christ, or the God man, here and now, or Jesus with his twelve disciplined faculties, signifying thirteen, or the sacred number of God. Christ, as unmodified consciousness, is in all men, and when all false beliefs are distilled from man, the pure essence, or Christ, comes forth. This distillation or purification comes after the complete disciplining of each of our twelve faculties. We must be incapable of seeing anything but the good. We must perceive divine perfection everywhere and in every man. We must give beauty for ashes and oil for joy for mourning. Truth is an inward perception. Therefore, by constantly turning our eyes inwardly toward the real and feeling the song of triumph within, we call the first disciple, Andrew, to discipleship. We call hearing, or Peter, to discipleship by hearing only the good tidings, the gospel or good spell. This is an inner hearing, the disciplined hearing of the mystic who hears only the voice of God or good and cannot hear other than the truth about any person. By constant application, by daily meditation and prayer, we call forth the Christ or true self of man and reveal man as God. He confessed and denied not. Denial which is to appropriate the feeling of being what we long to be. No negative statements are used. The baptism of John symbolizes this process. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. That prophet is Jesus or our conviction or feeling of being free, if we thrill to this feeling, it is essentially a prophecy. Elias means the same as Elijah. God is my Father. We must discover the law of consciousness before we can come out of a state of limitation. Elijah must come Jonah, or John goes a step higher than Elijah, which simply means that a man discovering his own consciousness to be God acts on that assumption and begins to change his world. 
Many are in the Elijah state. They intelligently affirm that God is within, but do nothing about it. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. This is the innate principle in all men, forever seeking light and expression. It is God seeking to come forth in givingness and livingness. The eternal urge in man is to give life, love, and beauty to the world. The moment he ceases to do this, he dies. He crumbles up in disease and mental decay. It is our instinctive desire to give beauty, order, and symmetry to the world. God is the circle, and he is the center everywhere with no circumference. We form a perfect circle when we send forth thoughts of life, love, and beauty to all around us. Then beauty and love come back to us, multiplied a hundredfold. The libido's impulse flowing through us all is not just a biological sex impulse, but is the complete comprehension of God, which is givingness or pure desire. God is pure desire. The wilderness is our state of frustration due to our unwillingness to share our gifts with the world. We must give, give and give. All can give a gift of love in consciousness, which is the greatest of all gifts. I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. If now in the silence you raise your consciousness or ascend into the hill of God and see people, conditions, and things as they ought to be and feel the joy of the answered prayer, you have given better than you knew to the world and to your fellow man. Material giving always follows, never precedes the gift in consciousness. Make straight the way of the Lord simply means the state that is to come in desire. We clear the way for it by removing all obstacles such as doubt, fear, and idle thoughts. I baptize with water. Water will assume the shape of any vessel into which it is poured. Water therefore means unconditioned consciousness, which is all things to all men. When we use the I am, we condition consciousness by believing, think emotionalized thoughts, I am sick, I am old, I am tired. And these emotionalized ideas become fixed states, i.e. are poured into a vessel and assume its shape. Water is a cleansing agent. We cleanse or purge consciousness from sin, from a mistake or limitation by assuming a mood or cultivating a new idea in our mind and thrilling to it. It finally becomes a conviction within us. The reader therefore will see that when the book of John, which is pure mysticism, says, I am not the Christ. It means John, the conscious mind, is not the Christ, whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. The conscious mind is not creative. The subjective mind is all wisdom, all power, all intelligence, and omnipresent. We must therefore still the conscious mind and dwell in the secret place of the most high and pure consciousness. When all our sense perceptions such as seeing, hearing, feeling, etc., are turned inward to the real, and we feel and sing the song of triumph, we are in prayer or in tune with the infinite. We have a problem. It is the effect of a cause we ourselves have set in motion. We must surely know that God has no problem. God is peace, love, and infinite intelligence. All we have to do when confused is to leave the world of noise together with the problem and listen to the voice of the Holy One of Israel, God, in this stillness, the mind is lifted to a higher level of consciousness where all earthly quantities cease. It is then that liberation is achieved. Intuition, which is the all-knowing of God, flows through the problem and there is no problem. We must realize that God is not confused. He does not know the problem. He knows only the answer. We therefore rise to the point of recognition of the correct answer. As an analogy, mathematics of or by itself does not know problem or error. It knows only the answer. Mathematics cannot possibly know error. We are living in a cosmos, not a chaos. Everything in the cosmos is orderly. Man creates disorder. Therefore, as we meditate or pray, we must forever keep our eyes steadfastly on God or our God, knowing that God is the answer and not the problem. In the great drama of life, God is the only actor. He is not only the actor, he also is the scribe and the script. Man is God's radiation, 
an extension of the limitless, one, playing for a little while the billions of parts we call personal lives. When the particular role is ended, the garment no longer needed disintegrates, and the spirit which gave it life returns to its source. For are we not told nothing is lost in all my holy mount? When man dies, his spirit lives on in all men. It never dies. It carries on until the end of the cosmic day, until all are reabsorbed into the one. The perfect man is not born, but when one man sees him face to face, no one can imagine what a cataclysm will take place. Instantaneously all men will awaken from the dream of being man, because there is only one man, and all men in the world are merely extensions in space of that one man. However, all men being within each of us, it follows that when one fully awakens, all awaken, that they all may be one, as thou Father art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one with us, and the glory which thou gayest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. John 17, 21 and 22. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. John 17, 23. Esoterically, this means that when we identify ourselves with the light, we become the light and flow again with the light limitless. No man can see the face of the Father and live simply means that when the perfect man awakens, he becomes one with the Father or one with the All. The particular now becomes the universal, then all men become perfect simultaneously. The scroll is rolled up and man dreams a new dream. Because there is only man, let us stop fooling ourselves and trying to make many out of the one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. John 3, eight. One may go east, another west, but it is the fixed psychological state that counts, the set of the sail, the invisible to the visible. Those that thou gayest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition. John 17.12 all words, beliefs, impressions, and suggestions are being fulfilled and nothing is lost but the sense of loss, perdition. If Joseph and Anne are climbing the mountain and Anne says to Joe, I want snow and Joe wants sunshine, doth not all things exist simultaneously in the absolute? All things exist in God. He contains all things, therefore, though their hands be joined together as they climb the mountain, if they reach high enough in spiritual awareness, each will be conscious of snow and sunshine, separately according to his will. Psychologists have proven that when a man is hypnotized and it is suggested to him that a blizzard is blowing, even though it may be a hundred degrees in the shade, he sees snow and feels cold, for it is all belief. Canst thou believe? All things are possible to him that believeth. We often hear the trite saying, what about material laws? The only material laws there are were given birth by you, the reader, and exist as long as you believe them. Though you now believe in the laws of motion, some do not and are therefore not subject to the same law. Jesus said, I come to make the blind see and those that see blind, meaning all things exist now, but we refuse to believe it. Canst thou believe that you, your consciousness, are God walking the earth? when you think and act from absolute consciousness level. Consciousness, or God, ever creates in its image and likeness on microcosmic as well as macrocosmic scales. The created is always relative to the creator consciousness. Chapter 8. Sleep. The Sabbath. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. Proverbs 6.22 In sleep we are united with our Father every night. We become one with the Ancient of Days. Prior to falling asleep, students of the mysteries must learn to behold the scintillating white light that shines forever on the great white throne, which is the secret place of the Most High, or the Holy of Holies within man. We can imagine 
that we see this white light and this will completely still the mind. Nothing can appear on the white screen without our permission. Now we are first in the pool. No man can get into this pool of silence but our I am, which is the first person and present tense. But while I am cometh another steppeth down before me, John 5, 7. That which steps down before you are the idle thoughts such as fear, doubt, despair, self-pity, and similar moods. If you banish these evil spirits or moods, Jesus, your own I amness, will speak softly and say, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. Then the healing comes, meditating on the eternal verities and the inner glory and beauties of the deity, man feels a movement within him. This is the divine light and it is visible as a golden yellow light. Words cannot always define and formulate the things behind the veil. There are, of course, many mystical experiences which we cannot express with words. The ecstasy of heavenly bliss, of love and happiness. Meditation is the inner communion which works like a thief in the night, silently in man's own soul. This mood cannot be expressed in words or language as it is beyond all formulation into word symbolism. To enter into the silence is intercommunion with the self or the Christ within. This is the nearest approach to the invisible. To receive inspiration in Bible passages, the following procedure will be found very helpful. Begin to imagine and dwell on the fact that in the deep of yourself sits the King of the Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the Prince of Peace, whose dress is white, so also is the appearance of the light of his face. Imagine this being sitting upon a throne of scintillating light that he may give light to you. Realize now that your intellect is being anointed by the Christ or truth. You will find your spine tingles and your forehead becomes moist. This is the dew from heaven. My head is filled with dew. Elohim shall give thee of the dew of heaven. Many good people think the sleep is intended for rest of the body, inertia of mind and body. It is believed that a restorative process sets in resulting in a feeling of well-being, due to the fact there is a restoration of physical energy. The reason we go to sleep is to develop spiritually and for no other purpose. Therefore, it is of paramount importance that we avoid all discordant states prior to sleep. The divinity that shapes our ends is all wise and has so arranged it that man is compelled to withdraw from the world of noise which is not conducive to spiritual enfoldments. Man is divinely guided in sleep. Answers to many problems are given him in the sleep state. Formulas, inventive devices, poems, contents for many volumes are also given in this dream state. The contents of many chapters and chemical textbooks in the engineering laboratories of the world appeared in a dream, an answer to a request of the dreamer. Sleep, therefore, does not mean rest for the physical body in the sense of inactivity, mental or otherwise. On the contrary, sleep protects one from the confusion chaos and distraction of the objective sense world. Paul said, I die daily. Sleep is akin to death. The only difference being that in the so-called sleep of death, we sleep a little longer. There is no absence of the one presence. Therefore, we cannot go outside ourselves and all experiences take place in our own consciousness. Suppose, for example, you want to invent or discover something and you have no procedure to go by, no textbook reference. You may have a vague idea of what you want to invent or discover, and that is all. The technique is simple. Learn all you can about it objectively, and then in a passive state dwell on a mental picture of that which you wish to invent. Then turn your mental picture over to your subconscious mind and go to sleep. When you awaken, be sure and follow the hunches you receive. It sometimes comes as an inner feeling that the solution lies in a certain direction or in a certain group of facts. You will find that many times the entire formula or solution may appear in a dream. In such cases, it is wise to have a pencil near you as you sleep, so that when you awaken, you may jot down the impressions that come to you in your dream. Some say, I never dream. We all dream. And if you don't remember your dream, simply suggest to your subconscious before you drop off to sleep one word, remember. It knows that you want to remember and will faithfully follow your instructions. As we all know, the subconscious never sleeps. If you are a writer, teacher, doctor, housewife, or stenographer, 
you can utilize this great truth to your advantage night after night. Give your subconscious the right mental picture to go to work on each night knowing that it will reproduce your request in exact accordance with your desire. The book of Genesis says that God rested the seventh day. Some good people reading the Bible literally seem to think that God was fatigued or needed rest after six days' work. Such a conception, of course, is unthinkable and absurd. And God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because that in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. This quotation has nothing whatever to do with physical repose or rest. The Sabbath may be any hour or moment of the day or night. It means the supreme satisfaction that follows prayer, an inner knowing that what you prayed for is an established fact in your own consciousness, and as within, so without. Therefore, in calmness and in peace, you await the external evidence of the inner experience. We have two ears, two nostrils, two eyes, and seventh, a mouth. Through this, as Plato says, mortal things have their entrance, immortal their exit. All the food we eat is consumed to tissue, bone, muscle. Finally, the body disintegrates and returns to the elements. But in the silence, communing with God, when the seven faculties are stilled, the still small voice of the undying God speaks through the lips. This may be the voice of intuition, the voice having healing in its vibration, or it may be the fourth dimensional feeling of it is finished. This is the rest or Sabbath of the Lord. Chapter 9 the temple not made with hands. And King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram out of Tiri. He was a widow's son of the tribe of Naphtali. And his father was a man of Tiri and a worker in brass. He was filled with wisdom and understanding to work all works in brass. And he came to King Solomon and wrought all his works. 1 Kings 7, 13, 14. In the center of man is forever burning the eternal flame of God. This center is the Holy of Holies in which abides the Absolute. The buildings adjacent to King Solomon's temple are your environment, family life, companionship, friends, in fact, every department of your life, business and social. There must be no taint in any of them. Purity of purpose, integrity of action, self-mastery of thought and emotion, generic virtue, all these are the fundamental basis for the erection of the temple not made with hands. This is man's participation and liberation. Thus can he seek entrance into the Holy of Holies. This is accomplished by following the advice of the prophets of old. Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. In other words, we must practice the presence of God everywhere and at all times. Practicing the presence of God symbolizes the vast treasures of gold and precious stones necessary in the construction of Solomon's temple, which is you. The truth of being is that whole wide world and all things contained therein are the self-expression of God. Man not understanding the greatest truths forms false beliefs about the truth. He sees limitations of all kinds around him. He feels himself to be separate from God and dependent on his own efforts. Let us realize that God is doing all things through us. If another person seems to behave badly to the capacity of your thinking and feeling that God is working through him, will his conduct change? However, why should we dwell upon and magnify the seeming faults of others? Everyone has God-like qualities if we would only look for them. Seek and ye shall find. If you look for what is good, you will find it. For your own peace and happiness if for no higher purpose, an effort should be made to seek out the good qualities in others. It is told that when Thales was asked what the most difficult thing to do was and what was the easiest, he answered, the hardest thing to do is to learn to know oneself, the easiest to find fault with the doings of other people. If you are at any time endowed with God's grace to heal, realize that God is healing this person through me. This is building the temple of God for you, the reader, are the temple of the living God. And he set up the pillars in the porch of the temple, and he set up the right pillar and called the name thereof Jachin. 
and he set up the left pillar and called the name thereof Boaz. Jachin is infinite personality or the presence of God in each of us. He is personal to each of us. The other pillar is the law of cause and effect. As you sow, so shall you reap, which is impersonal and may also be called love. These two form the entrance to King Solomon's temple in which is the secret place of the Most High within each of us. God abides in the silence. Truth is transmitted in the silence. The truth is lived in the silence. Haram, who builds the temple, is man who is now aware of the fact that his consciousness is God. It stood upon twelve oxen, three looking toward the north, and three looking toward the west, and three looking toward the south, and three looking toward the east. And the sea was set above them, and all their hinder parts were inward. 1 Kings 7.25 Oxen are emasculated bulls, which simply mean that before we can finish the temple and awaken the illusion of suffering, evil and chaos to the reality of love, compassion and wisdom, we must discipline our faculties. Otherwise, like the bull, we will run wild and our senses will become our master instead of our servant. Some men live to eat, drink, and satisfy the passions and appetites. Such a man is referred to in the Bible as the snake that crawls on its belly, eating earth. Therefore seek permanent values wherein is found the only reality of a divine plan. The three oxen looking toward the north are Andrew, Peter, and James, which symbolize perception, hearing, and right judgment. The three looking toward the west are John, Philip, and Bartholomew, symbolizing love, emotion, and the disciplined imagination of man. The three looking toward the south are Thomas, Matthew, and James, which denote turning your attention from the negative conditions and accepting desires and ability to pierce the veil. The three looking toward the east are Thaddeus, Simon of Canaan, and Judas, who portray man in prayer, whereby he turns within and sings the song of triumph with the praise of God forever on his lips. He abides in a mystic feast of joy, peace, and happiness, and then he rests. The rest is Judas, or complete detachment from all that would deny his good the good for himself or another. When we finally have disciplined Judas or the quality of dying daily to all false beliefs, there will no longer be a necessity for disciplining the other faculties, as Judas is the greatest of all disciples when disciplined. It means that we die to everything but the power of God, and we simply live in the presence of God all the time. This is calling Judas to discipleship. Then do we reveal Jesus our Savior, therefore Judas must betray or reveal Jesus, who is our own consciousness, our Savior. He that dips with me in the dish, he it is that will betray me. He now touches reality in the depths of himself by appropriating a new state of consciousness and dies to all former concepts of himself. He has dipped with Christ in the loving state of consciousness or the universal dish called the subjective or God in the smiling repose. Jesus feeds Judas. Judas appropriates the sop. Before this, Judas was always considered poor. Now Judas has fed him with the knowledge of the Savior, and the Judas state has been changed to Jesus, our ideal state. And all their hinder parts were inward, 1 Kings 7.25. This means that in prayer, we withdraw our faculties from the world of sense and turn inward toward the real, the one, the beautiful, and the good. In other words, we deny that which we see in the world of sound and go back to the silence. God abides in the silence. The Masonic legend states that Hiram was murdered by three ruffians before the temple was completed and dedicated. The three ruffians are our ignorance of the truth, our race beliefs, superstitions, and fears. These three ruffians are in all of us and constantly slay the Christ principle. The truth student and mystic, of course, realize that this means we go through three degrees or steps every time we die to an old belief. These three degrees are recognition that Haram is the seed of causation. Second, the new ideal or purified desire. Third, the feeling or conviction of now being the person you desire to be. This is the only crucifixion, change of consciousness, there is. The story of the crucifixion is a mystical drama and seen through the eyes of the mystic is one of the most beautiful stories ever told. Good Friday should be every day for the student of truth. Good Friday is now dedicated by the Christian churches to sorrow and sadness. 
When man understands its true meaning, it should be and will be a day of joy, celebration, and happiness. The reason is perfectly obvious. We rejoice in the good. We have now told the truth. The Jews did not slay Jesus, the Savior. How could they? He is always with us. He is our Savior and salvation. He abides in the heart of every man. Our Savior is slain only by man when he does not in consciousness recognize and sustain faith in the realization of his desires. This Savior is our own consciousness. It was never born and will never die. As we change our consciousness, we die to our old state and are reborn in the new state. The Christ principle in man never dies. Water wets it not, fire burns it not, wind blows it not away. Therefore, why grievest thou for it? Jesus has many meanings. It means to save. It also means desire, i.e. your desires when accepted by you save you. Jesus also means your consciousness, the liberator, the emancipator, liberated self. In order for you to realize your desire, it must die or be stilled. You still it this way by now entering into the mood of acceptance of your desire. Contemplate the joy that would be yours if you had your ideal now and feel it until it becomes a conviction. There must be no break in your sustained faith. Then follows the rest or Sabbath of the Lord. You now have the inner knowing that tells all those who pray aright that it is finished. Man does not seek that which he has. Your former state is slain and a new Jesus saving a state of consciousness is resurrected. I am the resurrection and the life. This is the true meaning of the resurrection scripture story. It is high time that Christians painted the true picture of Jesus to the world. If we do that, all will want to emulate the glorious picture of the true Jesus who depicted the Christ awakened man or anointed state of consciousness. Man will become as Jesus, the Christ, the kindliest man that ever walked the earth, the noble, dignified man who loves humanity, who has compassion on the multitude and feeds them, the ideal man who walks on the waters, who translates his body at will, who says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The praise of God will be forever on his lips. Jesus always said, I thank thee, Father, that thou hearest me. He it is who wore the seamless robe of consciousness, who ate only the best, the man who could read the thoughts of others and forgive and heal them, the man who never condemned anyone, but said, forgive till seventy times seven, the man who said to the thief, this day shall thou be with me in paradise, the man who knew nothing about laws of gravitation and motion, but could be where he wanted to be at will, the man who could go through the eye of a needle and revibrate himself again. The man who could go through barred walls, doors, and windows. The man who awakened from the dream of being man and ascended in the clouds to the glory which was his before the world was, the I Am state. Therefore, the ultimate mystical meaning of the crucifixion of Jesus is simply the psychological transformation and transmutation of consciousness whereby man awakens to his godhood here and now, and no longer asks for their light, but realizes, I am the light of the world. He then becomes the radiance of the light limitless, and his eyes are now God's eyes. His forgiveness is now the forgiveness of the absolute, the only one, and the absolute love of all mankind. The God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when in books, in pulpits, and in classrooms, we dramatize the Bible, the true story of Jesus the Christ we will begin to change the consciousness of the nation and the world. We consciously become God's radiation, dissolving the barrier between man and man. We must now paint the true picture of Jesus the Christ and not the hideous picture painted for 2,000 years of a man of sorrows, bleeding on the cross with a crown of thorns. It is small wonder that no boy wants to be Jesus Christ, the victim. No, he would rather be a soldier or an aviator or maker of an atomic bomb so that he may drop bombs of destruction on his seeming enemy. Science without Christ consciousness, wisdom of God, means the destruction of mankind. If we paint the true picture, every boy will want to be Jesus, the victor. He will want to emulate the perfect ideal. And we have carved a model of perfection, which is good and beautiful. The basic pattern of the world is beauty 
and the particulars are suspended from the universal like roses hanging from a vine. It behooves all of us to let Hiram build the temple. This represents a state of spiritual, intellectual, and worldly emancipation. We must cease sacrificing the beautiful for what we consider the riches of the world. Let us begin now to change the superstition and discord into an ingot of spiritual gold. Meditating on these great truths, we will surely build Solomon's temple here and now, which is your mind, your body, and affairs. We've been searching for the lost word, not knowing, not realizing, that when discovered it would be in our own manger, surrounded by the animals and marked by a blazing star or burning bush. This blazing star is the sun or our own spiritual consciousness called I am. I am is the lost word. Now, having found it, we can heal the blind, cure the sick, and raise the dead. Chapter 10 The Temple Completed The scripture says Haram of Tyre was a widow's son. This means one who is anointed with the wisdom of God, one who has the know-how or understanding to apply universal principles. Haram Abif means our father Haram. Haram really means I am or our consciousness which is the father of all. Everything in our world is an outpicturing of a state of consciousness within ourselves. When we change our consciousness, the outer picture must change too. It takes seven years to complete the temple. This means you must die daily to present precepts and keep on forever expanding your consciousness. Every thought of negation must die within you, and you must live only in the Christ truth or wisdom of God. The power to succeed is latent within every one. There is a rest after a creative process. This is referred to as the seven years, and as we continue creating and generating greater values in life, we go from glory to glory. And there was neither hammer nor axe, nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in the building. 1 Kings 6 7. We create only in the silence. We must learn the effortless way of life, which is to be still and know that I am God. If we accept all our desires in consciousness by actually feeling the reality of the wish fulfilled, the screen of space without our devising ways and means, universal principles always set in motion methods of attainment. As we continue conditioning ourselves by daily rejecting all false race beliefs, such as the necessity to work for a living, the time will ultimately come when the man of tomorrow will only think and the thought will be precipitated before the eyes. This will include food, home, real castles in the air, money, and everything tangible or concrete. This world should be the playground for man, as well as a school of learning wherein he paints the glories of God in statues, in stone, on canvas, in flesh, in speech, in writing, in music. His first real work here is to meditate on the mysteries of life. These are the everlasting values. To the degree that we understand life, to that degree can the universe be the playground in which we truly enjoy life. We are meant to be happy, all wish for perfect peace and happiness. We cannot hope for more, nor need we pray for less. Our happiness depends on ourselves and not on others. We must learn to condition the weather at will and have any season of the year at any time. All these things must be done without sound of hammer or voice of workmen. King Solomon's temple means that each man is the king in his own right. Solomon is consciousness or father, son, and Holy Ghost. Consciousness, idea, and the feeling of being it. Therefore, each man is king or master of his ideas, feelings, and actions, and he can build the house not made with hands only in the silence, forever tuning in with the infinite. Three men supervise the building of this temple. They are Solomon, God or consciousness, Haram of Tyre, conscious mind, godlike ideas and concepts, and Haram Abif, subconscious mind. There is no mystery about this. The simplest way of stating it is the father or unconditioned consciousness generates the seed or idea, the feeling nature of man or the receptive attitude of mind receives the idea through feeling. What is impressed must be expressed. The thousands of workmen employed in the building are ideas, moods, beliefs, and opinions about people and things. 
the masters over the workmen are the predominant moods which we dwell. Moods are creative, consequently we must watch our moves wisely, for they may become enemies within our household. Every man is the reflection of the mood he entertains. Man must walk the earth in silence, contemplating eternal verities. Then he walks on the water. He is by the shores of reality, and all who come in its presence will say audibly or silently, There goes a holy man. At that moment, all who see him will think of God and be blessed, because they felt the presence of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The cedars of Lebanon are used in the construction of the temple of the living God. These represent wisdom and understanding and wealth. The cedars are the cross of Christ. The perpendicular beam is I am, or consciousness. Our fixed psychological belief is the horizontal or that which crossed it. There is no other cross. There never was and there never will be. Man is the cross and there is only man. The cross is God conceiving himself to be man. Let us for our own good now die on the cross and let the sword pierce our side and we will be resurrected as new beings. We will become illuminated and transformed from the Jesus state to the Christos plane of God being. Blood and water came out of his side. Blood and water do not fall from a dead man. This is a great truth and must be interpreted mystically and in no other way. Blood and water flow at birth. Therefore, it symbolizes the birth of the Christ consciousness. As this awareness expands, we say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be his angels. The angels and the saints are the divine ideas that we are radiating. It is the subtle aura of love toward all men the extension of ourselves as operating centers of consciousness. We realize all men are saints or holy because they are the channels through which the Holy One of Israel walks and talks. We also say aloud, Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin of Mothers. We now have purified Mary or the subjective by true prayer and dispelled all false beliefs and superstitions. Now we bring forth the Blessed One, the beloved Son of God, the Christ consciousness. Our world is heaven and we abide in it. In conclusion, let us contemplate this profound truth. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2. This concludes The Wheels of Truth by Dr. Joseph Murphy. This is one of the most unique books that we have read so far by Joseph Murphy. We have covered many lectures and a number of books so far on the channel. We've read How to Attract Money, The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. This, I believe, is his first major book, and it is quite different than any of his other writing. It's very biblical in its text. It talks about specific biblical passages. It is deep. It does not talk about the subconscious mind as much as his other books. But there is some amazing writing and some incredible revelations that he's giving in this book. More than any other book, Dr. Joseph Murphy gives the premise that we are God, that you are God. This is something he does not mention as often in his later books, and perhaps it was so radical at the time that he found that he had to temper that particular message. So in many ways, this is Dr. Joseph Murphy at his rawest and most complete. When you're listening to this, you can hear the words of Neville Goddard, which makes me think that the idea that Abdullah, which was one of the original people that trained Dr. Joseph Murphy, you can check out my interview with Mitch Horowitz, you can hear the teachings of Abdullah in both Neville Goddard and in Joseph Murphy. The interpretation of the Bible, the way to look at the Bible, the way to understand the Bible as it being yourself. But he paints a picture of what happens before we become human and after we become human that Neville Goddard really never explains. He kind of hints at it. The idea that you and me are God is talked about relentlessly in all of these lectures but here we get a real feeling for what happens and he explains what it means 
One of my favorite chapters is when he talks about us in the future. We can just sit at our chair and we can imagine the food that we want and it will immediately be there. If we want to go to London, we can imagine we're in London and time space will be of no limit to us. This is an amazing idea and his idea of a future where we have come into connection with our God powers is absolutely consistent with the law of one material and a variety of other materials. We are awakening to these amazing abilities and we will be able to do all of these things. Clairvoyance, clairaudience. He is implying all of that stuff is open in our future. Once we become aware of our God power with true faith, anything is possible. We can travel instantaneously. Literally anything that comes into our mind is possible within this God power as we are dreaming this amazing dream right now, each of us being the same being, one being, and that is God. So I would love to know what your favorite phrase or chapter was in this book. There are so many wonderful things that stick at the tip of my mind as I think back on this book, and I would love to discuss it more with you. Please put your favorites in the comments, put a like on this video. People may know about Joseph Murphy, but do they really know until they've heard this book? Because this is next level stuff. In any case, you can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.